Hey, students, come on in, grab a seat. Let's get started tonight. Thanks for being here. I think you'll be very happy that you came. We're excited to have Lloyd Roberts, and we'll introduce him in just a moment. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about Marissa Barlow last week. I'd love to have a male student and a female student come up. And tell us one thing that you learned that was really valuable to you that, uh, okay, we have one right there. Come on up. And one more. Anybody else? You will get a free book uh, that Lloyd Roberts wrote, if you're willing to come up, if that helps. Okay, yeah, how about the young man right there? Come on up. I thought Marissa was awesome. It was, so, uh, it was so fun for me to see one of our students that has been through our center, taken classes from us, and then see that she's built a multi-million dollar business by following the practices that we teach here in our center. Uh, and I'm also very excited to uh, hear from a good friend of mine, Lloyd Roberts, as well. So give us your name. Hi. Hi. And what did you learn from Marissa? Uh, my name is Taylor, and I learned from Marissa that you need to be taking a lot of little steps to be curating your business, whatever that is, and that you need to be passionate about it or else it won't go as far. So. My name is Akira. I learned that um, it's important to talk to everyone around you and build your own network because you don't know what opportunities are going to arise from the people that you know. Thanks so much. Let's give him a hand. Being brave. Okay, um, one of our great students, uh, Chloe's going to come up and introduce Lloyd Roberts to us right now. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. My name's Chloe Jensen, and I'm so excited to introduce Lloyd Roberts tonight. So Lloyd is a dedicated husband, father, and serial entrepreneur who loves business and investing. Before co-founding his billion-dollar company, Lloyd had many ups and downs as an entrepreneur, with each new venture teaching him valuable lessons for the future. In 2021, his tech company was recognized by Inc. 5000 as the 21st fastest-growing software company in the country. Lloyd has been nominated for several awards, including the Win 100 Top 100 Entrepreneurs and the Mountain West Entrepreneur of the Year. Lloyd champions the idea of living an intentional life where life happens for you, not to you. He hopes to inspire others by sharing his discovery of a personal fulfillment formula that can be used by anyone to become truly fulfilled. Learn more at www.gcubedformula.com. We're so excited to hear from Lloyd, so we'll give it up to him. Thank you so much. All right, well, truly a pleasure to be here. I must admit, I feel a little bit awkward being here and to be in the center of attention in some way. So uh, thank you for this next 45, 50 minutes to be able to, to meet together and talk about some pretty cool things. All right, we can talk about all kinds of things and happy to have all kinds of questions at the end. Um, of course, the reason that often people want to hear from me or, or from my two brothers is because we founded Lone Pro. I don't know if you've heard of Lone Pro at all, but we are an unsexy software that is the back end of lenders, right? So you would use our software to manage, track, and service your loans. And this could be business-to-business -business loans. It can be personal loans. And we have just over 1,200 lenders throughout the U.S. and Canada that use our software to be the back end of, of their day-to-day -day operations. So it's been a, it's been a super fun ride. And, but in addition to that, excited about all kinds of additional things, uh, including investing and uh, things that are philanthropic in a lot of ways. We've been working with, with Mike and his team uh, a lot on some initiatives in Cambodia, and that's been super fun. We've launched a, a public charity called Become More, and we w I want to talk about some of those things as well today. And in addition, we've done some other pretty cool things that uh, super excited to address. But... Getting into it on the business front, of course, this is about entrepreneurship. Man, entrepreneurship, when you think about, show me by a raise of hands, who here desires to be a millionaire? Go ahead and put your hand in the air. Okay, how about 10 million or more? Would that be okay? What about 100 million or more? All right, so I got a couple hands in the air. What about a billionaire? Anybody want to be a billionaire? All right, I do. I want to be one of those. I'm not one of those yet, right? But, uh, but Lone Pro, we just became a unicorn, so super excited about that. And we're ranked the third fastest growing company in the state of Utah. And we've been able to do that while being profitable uh, 
we've, only, we've raised capital once, but it was all for taking chips off the table so that we could really lean into growing the business and hitting the different mile markers that we're hoping to hit at Loan Pro. Got some pretty cool partnerships. We just uh, finalized a partnership with Visa. Uh, my, my brother and our CEO just got back from Visa yesterday, and we're super excited about some new card, the plastic in your pocket, and how to, how to allow banks, credit unions, and all kinds of different financial institutions to be able to customize and personalize that card in a way that's never been done before. So we're way excited about this because it will be able to be done at the core level. There's never been innovation at the core level, meaning the, a lender can now connect with you in the ways that you want them to connect. Right now, they're only connecting through reward points, right? Hey, spend in this bucket on travel or dining, and we'll give you triple rewards. And that's across the board how it works. We're now changing the whole ecosystem where lenders can now customize and personalize on whatever the category is that you're interested in on how the core operating system works. Meaning, you, if let's say you had a the target market was single mothers or something along that lines. They could say, hey, swipes at the grocery store are now 0% interest, but swipes at the gas station work a little bit different, or maybe 90 days 0%, or maybe a lower rate, and they can customize based on the swipe. So super excited about some of the innovation that's happening in the lending space because lending touches everybody. And if you really want to get to the core of helping a first world country, we feel one of the best ways to do that is by increasing the amount of options that lenders have to connect with their borrowers. And lenders then can do two, one of two things. If they have an improved operating system, they can either make more money by reducing their overhead and streamlining their processes, and therefore more money lands on their bottom line, and they can keep it, which is good for them and their business, or they have the option of taking that additional margin and maybe increasing the credit spectrum. Maybe they give people with lower credit an option to get a loan. Maybe they pull down the interest rate, making the cost of capital a little bit less. So however these lenders decide to slice and dice the option, if we can change things for them at the core level, they now can have that competitive advantage. So love to talk about business, love to talk about investing. Today I want to talk about a couple additional things as well. And there should be a QR code. I don't know if I'm supposed to click something or, or who can do that to adjust the monitors here to show the QR code. But if you scan this QR code, oh, thank you. Oh, perfect. Great. Uh, this will take you to a website. And I'll be talking a little bit about this today. And it'll take you, I'll leave this up here for, for a minute or two, on to a formula. And this formula is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, as Mike brought up recently, just about six months ago, published the only book I've ever published, and it'll probably be the only one that I ever publish, and it's called G-Cubed. And I went on my own journey where a decade ago, me and my two co-founders and brothers, we were at the bottom end of the, the wealth spectrum in the United States, right, where we were often wondering, how am I going to pay my mortgage this month? And it's not that we weren't working. It's not that we were lazy. On the contrary, we were working... 50 to 100 hours every single week, right? It was uh, my, the only way my boy could see me on a Saturday is if he came to work with me, right? And we were doing all that we thought that we needed to do to try to win, and it just wasn't quite working. And it off, we were often left scratching our heads saying, what are we doing wrong? How do we adjust? We, we want to win, and we want to be able to have a legacy someday, but it, boy, it's just not actually happening, and then it did. And from the outside perspective, perspective, it happened relatively quick. And so for many years, there was a lot of things that I was passionate about. But one kind of subconscious belief that I had is that if I had a really fat bank account, I would be fulfilled. And I was talking, I wanted a fat bank account, right? But I thought a fat bank account was a million bucks. It's like, man, if I had a million bucks, can you imagine how it would be to have a million dollars? And then I got a million bucks, and I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not very much. I got 10 million bucks, and, woo! And, then, uh, and then it went from eight digits to nine digits. And it's like, okay, great. But as fun as it was on those peaks, it didn't last. And that was somewhat surprising to me. I was like, wait a minute, if I have a bank account with nine digits in it, if I never have to worry about money again, if I could give away fistfuls of cash every single day for the rest of my life, 
why don't I feel this high level of fulfillment that I've worked so hard to obtain? Because I didn't. I felt pretty much like I felt earlier. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, you have more conveniences, and if you want to order DoorDash, you don't have to worry about a mortgage and all kinds of pleasant things and conveniences that come with it. But after you get past the convenience level, there wasn't that spike of endorphins that you would get if, if your team won the big game or that you would think that if you, you won the lottery or sold the business or, oh my goodness, that you would be on cloud nine and stay close to cloud nine for an indefinite period of time. And my experience was that as fun as it was, that it quickly subsided. And I was having these thoughts and thinking about that and thinking, okay, great, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for some, the successes that we've had, but there has to be something more. And then I got a call from my younger sister. And my younger sister was sick for many years, about a decade. And we started talking. I'm like, hey, Susie, how you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm doing good. We're talking, just chit-chat for about five minutes. And after about five minutes, I heard this beeping. It's like beep, beep, beep in the background. And I was like, hey, wait a minute, Susie, where are you? Are you in the hospital? And she's like, oh, yes, I'm in the hospital. And I'm like, okay, are you doing okay? She's like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty okay right now. You know, as soon as you get over about 106 on a fever, then your body actually starts to relax a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it started to relax. And she was at 106.8. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, wait a minute. Usually if somebody calls you and you're in the hospital, you probably aren't going to respond with, yeah, I'm doing good, and then just carry on a normal conversation. She had become so accustomed to being in a constant physical state of, of stress and pain that she didn't even really worry about it much. And she was at the bottom level in a lot of different categories as far as the world would look at, at someone and say that they should be happy, that they should be fulfilled, that they are successful, and that I would want to trade places with this person's life. I don't know anybody that would have wanted to trade places with her but yet, I hung up that phone, and I realized, wait a minute, she's fulfilled. Her circumstances are miserable. She's close to dying. And she's fulfilled. And it put me on this weird little journey. And the book G-Cubed is that weird little journey where I was thinking, okay, great. There has to be a formula. There has to be a recipe that anybody can use, regardless of the culture of their family, if they're tied and to, if they've, if they've hooked their, their wagon to a religion, if they're born on the other side of the country, their gender, their race, their economics, no matter the scenario, this decade or a thousand years ago, there has to be a formula that anybody could use to become truly fulfilled. And I realized that I didn't have it. And so I went on a journey to try to find it. And it was like I was trying to find like a master baker. And I wanted to find like this amazing cake. And it was just so beautiful. And I could see it there and be like, oh my goodness, this cake, it looks good. And then let me sample it. And it tastes good. And I wanted to say to the baker, give me the recipe to this exact cake right here. I just want to replicate that. You've done the work give me the recipe. And what I found when I listened to podcasts and went to seminars and read and listened, and frankly, I put a lot of things aside for about two years. I haven't watched public television since then, right? Don't even like commercials anymore. And, uh, and I feel, tried to fill my spare time with this thought. If I'm on the treadmill, if I'm running, you know, a 5K, if I'm laying in bed at night, this thought persisted in my mind. What is the formula? How, what is the recipe? And as grateful as I was when I would ask this of some really inf influential people in the world in this space, I felt like I, I was saying to a master baker, whoa, beautiful cake, delicious, what's the recipe? And they would say, well, let me tell you about flour. Flour is incredible. Do you know about flour? You can do all these things, the flour... And then they'd go on to, well, what about sugar? Do you know about sugar? What about salt? What about chocolate? And, and they'd talk about these amazing ingredients, but they would never get to the spot of actually giving me the recipe. And 
I didn't want to make my own formula. I didn't want to make my own recipe. I didn't want to go through the decade or two decades or maybe my whole life and not be able to replicate what clearly somebody else would, was able to do. I just really wanted them to say, here is the exact recipe. And they w- I never found anybody who was willing to do that. I said, in, in short, I felt like the answer was, here's all the ingredients. You need to find out the recipe that is right for you. It's custom. And that custom component, it didn't really resonate with me. So went on my own journey to find out what is the formula to truly being fulfilled. Clearly, having financial freedom is a good feeling. It's nice. But yet, when you get past the comfort level, once you're not worried about paying your mortgage, once you're not worried if you're going to eat, if your kids are going to eat, if you're going to be able to have reasonable transportation that's not going to break down on you, as soon as you get that next dollar, it's not as impactful as that first dollar. And now you can have some, some luxuries, right? I'm not talking about yachts, but I'm talking about, oh, okay, let's order DoorDash or go out to eat. And I no longer have to say, well, if I do that, I can't do this. That's also nice. But that next dollar, it's not as impactful as that second dollar. And that second dollar wasn't as impactful as that first dollar. And when you pile up all the dollars together, I found that that last dollar, it didn't really matter that much. It's kind of weird. I mean... To be in a spot where you could lose millions of dollars and be like, eh, you know, there's no thought of crying. Heck, I would have cried like a baby if I had lost my first 10 grand. But uh, that next one doesn't really matter as much. And I found out that those last dollars, they simply are a magnifier of who you actually are. That's all they are. If you're a bad guy, you got more to be bad with. If you're a good guy, you got more to be good with. And I like that. But it, was, it became clear to me as, as almost as if my focus had been misguided for about two decades. Now, don't get me wrong. I was a good guy. And I, I, I tried to do a lot of good things. But I didn't really have the resources or the time to do so. And now that I had some more of these things, this new desire to find out what the formula was kind of obsessed me for a little bit. And oddly enough, I was thinking these thoughts, and I was thinking about a potential formula and the the fact that there isn't a a recipe out there that is at least marketed well, or at least that I had heard about. And I was running on the treadmill, and it was my younger sister's birthday, and she had passed away about a year earlier. And I was asking the question again, man, what is it? There has to be a formula. And I literally pictured in my mind's eye a white T-shirt and a big, large capital G to the power of three. And I audibly said to myself, G cubed. And, and then it's hard to explain the next part, but it was kind of a stacking event. It was like, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This could actually be it. And here it is. I'd love to go through it with you. If you can scan the QR code and then, there we go. This is the G, this is a G cube implementation process. And I'm going to go a little bit further. Uh, further through this. This is actually an implementation process worksheet to walk through the G-Cube formula. Now, I'm going to start with step two here and talk about the three Gs. The first G is gratitude. The second G is growth. And the third G is giving. That's it. I get it. I get that there's a lot of rest of, uh, a lot of ingredients out there. And I get that I'm leaving a lot of those ingredients out. But what I'm doing here is focusing in on the three most likely ingredients to peak your level of fulfillment across the board, to have you be the word happy. I don't really like to use the word happy very much because Disney's kind of patented that word now, right? So I like to use fulfilled. Fulfillment is different than happy. It requires work. It requires continual effort. And happiness can be something that is kind of given to you for a moment by somebody else. So starting with gratitude. Gratitude's the first G. Now, gratitude is something that we've all experienced, and it's super fun. Somebody comes and does something for you or gives you something, or you get this feeling inside of you that's organic, feels so good, and then we so naturally express that gratitude. It comes out of our facial expressions. It comes out of how we move our body, and then it subsides and we're left with being in the state that we were in before. 
And then we wait and we hope that we can have that gratitude come to us again. But forcing the gratitude seems unauthentic, seems almost cheesy or fake. And yet, did you realize that our circumstances don't actually dictate our level of gratitude or our level of, a lever of, level of overall fulfillment? There's two things that dictate if you feel grateful. Well, excuse me, let me step back. Gratitude is the inverse of gratitude. Anybody, any ideas what the inverse of gratitude is? What's the opposite of gratitude? Selfishness, okay? I love it. I'll use a word very similar to that called entitlement. Now, I get it. This, this general concept is something that can be offensive to some, but I'm going to say it anyways. You and I, we are entitled to absolutely nothing. Not a single thing. Not the money in your bank account. Not to have your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend show love to you in the way that you desire them to show love to you. Not to be in an air-conditioned or heated room. To have a roof over your head tonight as you sleep. To wake up in the morning. To have air pumping through your, your lungs or blood pumping through your veins. We're actually not entitled to anything. Now, I get it. We can argue that we're entitled to stuff, okay? But let's put that aside for a second. Let's pretend that we're literally entitled to zero. When we have entitlements, it's like we grab them and we hold them tight to our chest and we invite people, you know, I dare you to steal my entitlements. These are mine. We fight for them all day to hold them tight. And then if we get to the end of the day, most likely nobody took all our entitlements. And then we don't even feel peace. We don't feel pleasure. We at best feel like something wasn't stolen from us because we were successful on holding on to it. But what if you made the cognizant choice to decide that you're entitled to zero? Nothing. Literally nothing. You're not entitled to have your mom tell you that she loves you. You're not entitled to any of these basic things that we subconsciously just no, that's mine. How can they not do that? They didn't call me on my birthday, right? With all these things that we feel entitled to. What if you made the decision to decide you're entitled to nothing? Well, my belief is that when you become entitled to nothing or when you root out entitlement, it is organically replaced with gratitude. So you don't have to say, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, yay! No, nope. instead you say, let me remove entitlement and gratitude will naturally fill in all the cracks. Okay, the next G is growth. When we think about growth, and even when I'm standing on a stage right now, it is often tied very closely to success. But I don't mean success. Success is the, is the byproduct of sustained growth. So we often can see it. Imagine that we're at Bear Lake. We look out into the lake, and in a, quite a distance, we see a white line. We're not quite sure what it is. We pull out the binoculars, and we take a good look, and we see that it's a boat. And the boat has quite a long tail. It has a wake that is behind it. That wake is the success or the, sustain or the byproduct of sustained growth. But yet it's not the driver. If the growth stops, the wake will inevitably stop shortly thereafter. We're talking about growth right now. Growth could be anything. Sure, it could be building a unicorn, right? That might be a little flashy. It could be anything, though. It could be planting a garden. It could be weeding a garden. It could be knitting a sweater, one a week, and you give them away to someone in need. It, it could be taking the class. It could be reading the book. It could be putting down the bottle. It could literally be anything. It's progress. It's not success. It's simply that you're progressing in the direction that is meaningful to you. And the last category is giving. This is probably my favorite category because, honestly, it's the most fun you will ever have. I'm not talking about giving like a business transaction. And think about how often we do this. I'm going to give you A, and then I expect B in return. Well, that's not giving. It's called a transaction. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking giving without pretense. You expect nothing in return, and it's not even necessarily you that's giving. But you invite a form of light, whatever you want to call it, as grace, if it's Mother Nature, if it's God, whatever you want to call it, something greater than you to have light flow through you to someone else. So you're not necessarily looking at what do I want to do? How do I want to give? 
but instead you're inviting light to flow in and through you to bless the lives of others. Maybe those you know and maybe those you love, spouse, kids, parents, neighbors, maybe those you've never met, maybe those on the other side of the globe. The great thing about this giving step is not just how much it blesses somebody else, but what it does to you. The change and the elevated level of fulfillment that it gives you. Now, we all think of money, right? Oh, great. Oh, giving. I can't really give. I don't really have very much. I'm a poor college student right now. Well, money is probably the least valuable way to give. Give of your time. Give of your talent. At a time and a season, maybe your treasure, but maybe not today. Then, so if you look at this formula, there is an innate desire at a subconscious level to do what we do in school. Let's go back to high school, right? And let's say that all you have is three grades. And let's say you get an A in the first class and a B in the, in the second class and a C in the third class. Well, we innately know, oh, okay, well, I got a B average or a 3.0, right? It's the summation formula that our subconscious minds believes is what leads us to fulfillment. And so if you're doing, let's say, an A in gratitude and a B in growth and a C in giving, then you would innately think that your overall fulfillment level would be a B. That's how the summation formula works. But this is not the summation formula. This is actually the multiplication. There's that invisible G. When you look at the capital G to the power of three, we know that that's not adding G plus G plus G equals something. We know that it's G times G times G. Imagine for, with me for a moment that some mock person is rich and attractive and articulate and growing continually, clearly gets a high score in the growth category, right? Let's tie some numbers to it. Let's say if you are amazing at the G, you get a five. If you're, if you're good at it, you get a four. If you're medium, a three. Poor, uh, I don't know, or, or okay, you know, poor, a two, and pretty, pretty pathetic, a one, right? We can go through this process of actually scoring out what your current level of fulfillment is in the different categories. We have a mock example right here of the physical body, but that's only one, right? So let's say this mock person's getting a five in the growth category. Let's say the same person's getting a five in the giving category. They're giving away gobs of money, and they're donating their time to, you know, some cause of something that they're really good at. And imagine that this same person, when they're driving home at night, they get cut off on the freeway, they flip the person off, and they want to pull over and fight them, and then they get home, and their spouse doesn't respond in the way that they were expecting them to respond, and their children are nowhere to be found, and, you know, don't they understand all these things I'm doing for them? If a person is rich and famous and attractive and giving and angry, what kind of life does that person have? Well, they have an angry life. If we did the summation, what our subconscious mind does, that would be a 2 plus 5 plus 5, or 12 out of 15, or a B level of fulfillment. And yet, we expect that this is how it works for everybody. Now, if I look at you, I'm like, oh, okay, well, if you put in okay, you're going to get out okay. But yet, I innately know it doesn't work for me. And so I don't think that the formula is broken. I think I'm broken. I'm the problem. And if I'm the problem, then raising my G scores, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't work for me anyways. I get it, it works for you, but it doesn't work for me. But if we change it to the multiplication, then now we see that a 2 times 5 times 5 is 50. And you need 100 points to be truly fulfilled. So this person's flunking. No wonder they're miserable. No wonder we see so many people on the news that are flashy and they're clearly doing good and maybe the giving in the growth category. And yet they then harm themselves, go do crazy things. They're clearly miserable. And yet we and the media sometimes relish in that and say, see, money doesn't buy happiness. Or whatever things that we want to say to justify our own current conditions. But what if we didn't look at the formula as summation, but we looked at it as multiplication? And what if in our own life, when we went through the process, we didn't say, oh, I'm such an idiot. But instead, we had it be a call of action at the highest degree to say, wait a minute, I'm doing really good in this one category, but I'm not really doing very good in this other category. 
What if I raise that category? In this mock example, what if this person raised their, their gratitude score from a 2 to a 3? Well, now they're getting a C level of overall fulfillment. What if they chose to le- lef- l- lift it from a 2 to a 4? It's not perfect. It's not a 5. But it does allow them to have to become truly fulfilled. Perfection is not required. You don't need a five in all categories. And you won't stay a five in, in any specific category. Over time, they'll adjust, right? And you'll, adju- you'll adjust with them. But that is the formula. It is the multiplication of your gratitude score, your growth score, and your giving score to give you a measurable way to be able to see where am I starting, right? So we went over step two. Let me step back to go to step one. Step one is your state. It's your emotional state. It's a picture in your mind for, with me for a moment, somebody that is depressed. Right? I, w- I don't want you to get in their head. I want you to physically look at them. What do they look like? Are they shoulders drooped forward or are they rolled back? Is their chest extended? There's a droopy. Right? How are they sitting in their chair? How are they standing? What is going on with their arms? What's going on with their face? What do their eyebrows look like? What do the corners of their mouth look like? What do their eyes look like? Right? Something tells me that with almost complete accuracy, you can nail exactly what somebody looks like that's in a depressed state. But what about somebody that's in a beautiful state or a peak state or a state of love or a state of light? What does somebody like that look like? Right? Picture in your mind for a moment somebody that just won gold in, the, in an Olympic event. Who cares what event it is? What do they look like? Yeah, what, are the, what do their body movements look like? What does their face look like? And something tells me that you could also tell me with almost complete accuracy what somebody in a state of love, light, passion, energy, what that person looks like as well. Our situations, they don't actually dictate our state. Contrary to to what popular media will tell us. They don't. And that's the key. They don't actually dictate your state. Imagine for a moment that you're on your favorite beach. It's beautiful. Beautiful day. You got your favorite drink in your hand. Waves are perfect. And you're thinking about your pending divorce. Or you're thinking about how your dad just got arrested for doing something heinous. Your situation beautiful. But you're not your situation. You're somewhere else. So the two things that determine your state are, one, your physiology, how you hold your body, how you hold your face. The number one dictator of how you emotionally feel is based off your physiology. But yet we wait for our physiology. We wait for something to happen to us to express ourselves with our physical body, because we feel if we do it in, in the reverse order, we're being a hypocrite. I can't act excited. I can't act fun. I can't act energetic, passionate, until I feel like acting that way, and then I'm happy to do it. But if I do it in the, in the inverse, I'm kinda don't, I kind of don't—I feel like I'm a bit cheesy and not really being real. But did you know that they've scientifically proven that if you stand in the Wonder Woman or Superman pose— with your chest extended and your hands on your hips, with your feet about shoulder length apart and your chin at least at a 90 degree angle for 20 seconds, you have a 50% chance of making a hard decision, 50% increase in likelihood of being being willing to decide. That's just for 20 seconds. What if you actually adjusted something with your face? What if you adjusted something with your intonation? What if you had your body tell your mind how to feel? And the second one is your focus. What are you focusing on? Because what you focus on, you feel. Every time, the things you think about, you feel. My wife had a sign in our master bathroom for a few years there that said, what you focus on expands, so don't focus on your butt. So I thought that was relatively clever. Okay, but whatever you focus on, that's ultimately what you find. If you look, if you drive home tonight and you decide, hey, I'm going to look for a yellow vehicle, a yellow vehicle, a yellow vehicle, you'll likely end up finding a yellow vehicle. But if you don't, they'll come and go and with no ability for it to even stick in your mind. 
right? If you focus on something, you'll end up finding that. So that's the key to number one, adjusting your state. Realizing, anybody got a phone? Probably all have a phone. Pull that phone out for a minute. Hold it up in the air, if you will. This phone is, at the very core level, this is hardware, right? This is, this is the sleek corners. This is the glass screen. This is the battery. But yet, without software, it's simply a very expensive paperweight, right? We innately know that we are not our hardware. I can hold this cell phone in my hand, and I'm not going to say, oh, I just turned on. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say my phone turned on. We know that we're not our hardware, but yet without the software, this hardware is virtually useless. But yet, what is our software? If our hardware is our physical, tangible bodies, what is our software? Well, our software is our unconscious minds. It's the neural pathways. It's the, it's the dirt roads and the freeways that run through our mind. It's the, it's the ways we travel and how fast we get there. And here's the thing. We are, as much as we are not our hardware, we are also not our software. I've known I'm not my hardware since I was young. But I didn't know that I wasn't my software until year, a couple years ago. It's a crazy thought. I'm going to make a crazy statement here. But think about it for a second. You decide if it's true. Anyone in your exact same situation would act or react as you did. Anybody in that exact same situation with that exact same mental coding, I forgot that one, would act or react in the exact same way. And if you're not your tangible body, and if you're not your unconscious or subconscious mind, and if anybody that was in the same situation you were in, that had the same wiring that you had, would act or react just like you do, then why do we hold ourselves to such crazy standards? Why do we beat ourselves up? Oh, I did it again. How could I be such an idiot? Won't I ever learn? Oh, I just made myself into a liar. All these negative things, and i talking about me. I did this. I'm a loser. I can't ever do anything good when I'm not actually my unconscious mind. When anybody that is in that same situation that had this exact same mental coding would have done the exact same thing I did. So instead of beating ourselves up, what if we realized that we weren't our bodies and we weren't our unconscious mind, that we were something independent? You can call it whatever you will. Some people call it their spirit. Some people call it their soul. I like to call it my I am. Regardless, I'm not my hardware and I'm not my software. And I'm the user that gets to engage with these two incredible gifts to be able to see if they put out what works for me. And so if something comes in and the output isn't what I want, instead of saying, oh, Lloyd, I'm such an idiot. How could I do that again? Instead, I'm able to say, huh, I don't really like that. In Lone Pro, just last week, we had over 1,500 hours of developers tweaking bugs, or fixing bugs, tweaking the code, or adding new features. 1,500 hours of programmers going to town. Now, the software must be pretty bad if we need 1,500 hours of programmers doing that just in one week. Well, is it? Is our own software bad? Or maybe it's okay to go through and maybe tweak a little bit, fix a bug, maybe add a new feature. If the outcome, if I'm coding in my software company and, and one of the coders comes in and does something and the outcome, the output isn't what I want, do we fire the programmer? Or do we say, hey, I know what I want. This isn't it. Go in and fix it. Tweak it. Remove the bug. Add a new feature. It's not working right. And we tweak it until the outcome is what we want. And so if in your own life, if the outcome isn't what you want, instead of saying, I can't do it, I'm broken, what if we instead said, hey, what if I went through the process of tweaking it? What if I went through the process of adjusting? Because anybody that was in my exact same situation with this exact same wiring would have acted or reacted in that exact same way. So why am I going to judge myself for this? Why don't I just adjust the code to have the outcome that I'm looking for? So those are the first two things that you do is with the, the state, number one, state and emotion, don't leave it up to your circumstances. Because if you do, your circumstances will dictate it. You'll be sitting around waiting for someone to pass a love note down the aisle to give you the butterfly feeling. 
or for a stock that you bought to spike, to give you that rush that you're looking for. Don't wait for your circumstances to adjust to give you those endorphin releases you're looking for. Make it happen yourself. And you can do that by realizing that you're not your body, you're not your mind, you're the user of them. And so therefore, you have the ability to use them to adjust your physiology and adjust your focus to put you into the state that you want to be in. It's no one's job to adjust your emotional state but yours. Are there things that impact emotional states? Of course, there are. And some of them are chemical. And these are real challenges. But they don't el eliminate our responsibility to be the victors of our own life. They just don't. You're the one that decides your emotional state. And some struggle more than others. And that's a reality. And it is. But they still get to decide. They decide how they want to adjust their physiology and their focus. Okay. And then two is go and go. If you wanted to adjust something with your physical body or in any of the other categories, and the other categories are in your finances, in your school, your business or career, in your key relationships, or spiritual, however you define that, this is the process you can go through to say, hey, the outcome isn't what I'm looking for. I want to tweak the code. Adjust the state, step one. Step two, measure where you are right now. If I asked any of you right now, how fulfilled were you last Tuesday? Kind of would be hard to, to nail that down, wouldn't it? Well, I was X percent fulfilled. That's kind of hard to do. Well, this is what it does. It gives you an, ex, an exact number of how fulfilled you are now so that later you can measure against that and see if it went up or down. So go through the process. Okay, I'm a, I'm a five in gratitude. I'm a three in giving. I'm a two in growth, whatever it is, and it will pop out what your grade or your actual score is. Okay? And I, I beat that one quite a bit, so let me go on to number three. Number three is your current standard. And what do I mean by current standard? Right? Standards are something... Well, let me tell a story. A couple years ago, I went on a cruise. Okay? It was about a decade ago with my wife and another couple. We're super excited, barely had any money. So I found this cruise at like 299 bucks, seven day cruise, all you can eat. I was so excited. We booked it, flew to Florida, and we went on this cruise and it was so fun. I mean, I, I ate a little late night pizza, all you can eat ice cream. I'd ordered like three meals when we went into uh, the dining room, you know, a filet mignon and two crab legs or something like that. It was just fantastic. And this one day we had an excursion, so the boat stopped, and there's quite a few boats there. And we hopped off the boat, and we really didn't have any money, so we just took some snorkeling gear that we brought with us, and we went over to this little lagoon area. And it was pretty shallow, you know, it, it rotated from knee deep to neck deep. And we were about, me and my, my buddy Dave, we were about 200 yards out, something like that. And we're snorkeling, looking at all the tropical sea life while our wives were sitting back on the beach. And I'm snorkeling, and I bump into something. Don't know what it is, but I stand up. It's about chest deep, and I bumped into an older man. And he stood up as well. And I'm like, hey, sorry, man. Didn't mean to bump into you there. He's like, oh, it's okay. And then we struck up a conversation. He told us all about his world travels and you know, all this stuff. And me and my buddy Dave are talking to this older, older man. He seemed nice enough. And finally, he's like, hey, how's the food on your ship? And I'm like, oh, I think it's pretty great. And went off on how great it was and how nice it was to be able to order all you want. And it was completely free, all included. And he's like, oh, really? The, the food on our ship, it all tastes like soap. And our waiter, I can't even understand him. And he went off on how crappy his ship was. And there's quite a few ships out there. And I went off on how great our ship was and what a great experience this was. And then he said, well, what ship are you on? And I said, we're on that ship right there. And he said, we're on the exact same ship. And I said something to him that just was kind of tongue-in-cheek and said, well, I guess you just have higher standards than we do. And that was so offensive to him. He's like, what? What? I don't have any standards. I'm like, I don't know, man. I think you got pretty high standards. And I, I'm like, hey, what you're eating, uh, you think it tastes like soap. I think it tastes delicious. And he got so upset and un almost unfortunately, we kind of pushed his buttons. And he got so mad, he turned around his back to us. And he put, right before he put his face mask back on, he yelled out, I don't have any standards. And then he emerged himself in the water and started swimming away. Well, me and my buddy, we just laughed for the next minute or two, told our wives about it when we got back to the beach, and then we got her back on the ship. 
two, three days later, at the very last night of the ship, I haven't seen him on the ship the whole time. So I was starting to wonder if he was even on the same ship. And then we eat dinner, and then we go to the elevators to go back to our room. Elevator opens up. It's packed full. There's no way we're going to get on this elevator. And standing in the very front is this man. And I said, hey, it's the man with all the standards. And right before the doors close, he put his fist high in the air and says, I don't have any standards. And the doors close, and I never saw him again. And that, was a, that story has stuck with me for quite a while because why, why was he so mad that we teased him that he had high standards? And I think in today's age, oftentimes standards are related to your not being inclusive or you're exclusive or you think you're better than or you're superior in some way. But the reality is if we acknowledge them or not, we all have standards because standards are simply how you think things should be. They're your story. So if you ask yourself the question, if everything was as it should be, what would that look like? You could then break it down to a specific category. If everything was as it should be with my relationship with my spouse, what would that look like? Or if everything was as it should be with my physical body, what would that look like? Whatever you write out or type up after asking yourself that question, that is your standard. Well, I should be married by this point in my life. I should be this rich at this point in my life. I should have a, a home and a white picket fence and two and a half kids. Or whatever your story is, that is yours. And to realize it's your story. It's not reality. It's your story of how you think things should be. And if your standard is here, your story is here, and if your life is down here, that gap between these two is pain. And it always will be. Your standard's here, your life's here, that gap causes pain. If you raise your life up to your standard, you now feel at peace. If your life exceeds your standard, you feel pleasure or even joy. That's the measuring rod. Where is your standard and where is your life in measurement to your standard? It's not your neighbor's standard. It's not your mom's standard. She has her own. It's yours. So to realize you have two levers here, okay? So let's go, let's say in step three, you, you came up with what your standard was in this specific category. Now you know your story. Play with it, edit it, tweak it, have some fun with it. Most have not gone through this exercise to understand what their story is. They say, oh, the government tells me that this is how things should be. Oh, my religion tells me that this is what my story is. Even though the same, another person in their same religion has a completely different story that they're justifying that same religion to give them that story. They're completely independent, okay? I've even been in church. Had one person stand up and say, hard, 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 but life is supposed to be a test. And then the next, the next person stood up and literally said, Wonderful, wonderful, isn't it great that life is a dance? Huh, it's really kind of interesting. Same base, two different stories, okay? All right, step four, the standard adjustment. So now that we've identified our story, we've identified that we want to change it in some way, we want to elevate this specific G in some way, we have three options. Option number one is to adjust your life. We've already talked about it. Here's your standard, okay? Like, let's say you love your standard. You're happy with your standard, but you just haven't been measuring up. You're like, you know what? I just, uh, I need to step it up. This is the, what is often preached at a variety of pulpits, right? Step up. Be a man. Be a woman. Make it happen. Have some grit, right? That's what's said. And the truth is, that's really, really valuable. It's probably the most likely adjustment to your standard that you need to do. But it's not the only one. But it is the first one. So look at that and say, do I just need to step up my game? And if so, check the box, raise my life to meet my current standard. Option number two, though, is to elevate your standard. Okay? So let's imagine for a moment that your standard is, your story is, that it's okay to play video games for 10 hours a day and eat Cheetos in your underpants seven days a week. Okay? All right, so if that's, if that's your story, if that's your standard, you are most likely exceeding your standard. You're above it, so it's not causing you immediate pain. But yet, is it actually serving you? What if you actually changed your standard? What if you elevated it? What if you 
in the same swim lane or on the same totem pole, you lifted up your standard. What if you change your standard to, you know what, I do not play video games on weekdays, and I can play video games for two hours on Saturday and Sunday. What if you did that? What if you elevated your standard and then elevated your life to meet your standard? That's the second option. The third option is to change your standard. How often do we have parents, maybe even your own, that have expected something very specific of you? We in our family, we get straight A's. We in our family, we serve in the military. We in our family, we, we go on service trips that might last two years and are tied to religion, right? Whatever it is, they have a standard that they then project on you. Why? Well, they tell themselves it's because they know what's best for you. But what is it really? It's that their standard's here. And their life might be here. The problem is they tied their standard to the actions or behaviors of somebody else. If my standard is tied to the actions and behaviors of you, I'm now giving my control away. Well, why would we ever do that? Because we don't understand that we have any other options. We don't understand that we are in control of our standards. We think that standards are just how it is. It's how everything should be. This is how it is, right? I need to go to school and become a doctor. and That's how it's supposed to be. And when it's not, we feel that pain, not realizing that we have the ability to change our standards. So as emotionally positive as maybe in this mock example parents might be in saying, this is what we do in this family, as much as they would like to trick themselves that it's for your benefit, the reality is they are doing all they can do desperately to have you meet their standard. And they know they have no control. So they fight and they do whatever they reasonably need to do to get you to measure up to their standard. And you do it too. You do it to your friends. You do it to your siblings. You might even do it to your own kids. You might do it to your parents. Right? Hold them to your standard. Well, what if you change your standard? What if you literally disconnected the standard that's tied to somebody external? You ripped it out and you tied it to yourself. So now I'm in control. I get to decide because my standard and no action or behavior of anybody in this room other than myself can dictate what my standard is. What if I actually gave myself that freedom? Now I am no longer dictated by my circumstances on if I am fulfilled. Because my circumstances or your choices or your actions, positive or negative towards me, don't dictate if I'm fulfilled. Isn't that interesting? So that's number four. Decide. What are you going to change? Are you going to raise your life to meet your current standard? Are you going to raise your standard and then raise your life to meet it? Or are you going to completely rip out your standard? Right? Personal experience. Uh, Ten years ago, working my butt off. All I can do. I'm, an, I'm always been a passionate, hardworking individual, right? Um, we have our first set of twins. We have our second set of twins. I come home, and probably one or two days a week, my wife had dinner made. It was awesome. And the, other, and the rest of the day, she didn't. And I was like, oh, my goodness gracious. I'm doing check, 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 check. And, I'm, boy, she's not checking this box. How can she truly, fully love me? She's not even going to make dinner for the family. Oh, my goodness. And then I learned about this. And I learned that I was projecting my standard on her. I had a standard that if a wife truly loves a husband, then she'll make dinner. I clearly had standards that I was responsible for as well, but that wasn't her standard. Her standard wasn't to be a good wife, she makes dinner for her husband. She had completely different standards. And I wanted her to change to meet my standard. My standard, our life, pain wasn't happening. So I tried to be good and, you know, I, I bit my lip and I made dinner and you know, I tried to be a good sport about it. But what I didn't understand at the time is that my undertones kind of leaked through. thought I was being even, stepping up even more, but my undertones leaked through. Then I realized that it, this is my standard. I wanted her to change. And I probably did some undertone things that were not positive for our relationship. Then I realized, wow, why am I giving my power away to anybody else? You, you know, even my spouse. Why would I do that? And I took it back. 
And I went to step five, and I decided what I wanted my new story, my new standard to be. And I played with it. And I invite you to do so as well. Tweak it. Maybe you write it out. I have to type it up because i got to cut and paste and think about it and adjust it. And I ultimately came to the conclusion that my new story was making dinner for my family is an honor and an opportunity to spend quality time with my wife and kids. I wanted that to be my new story. It wasn't my new story yet, but I wanted it to be. Now, how do I go about changing my software that's currently wired that somebody else needs to do something for my life to measure up to my standard. How do I actually rip that out and have it no longer contingent upon their actions and behaviors, but upon my new story that I want? In the programming world, as you likely heard during uh, dinner, we kind of stumbled into programming. We didn't really plan to do this, so I don't really have a background in programming at all. So I thought that if you wanted, if you had a software and you wanted to improve it, you simply said, hey, coder, I'll pay you some money, this is what I want it to look like when you're done, and this is the end result I want popped out. Cool? All right, here's your money. Go. But that's not how it works at all. There's a middle step. It's called the project spec. And this is step, this is step five. This is you writing out exactly what you want it to be. In, in plain English, what do you want your new story to be? Write it out. Have some fun with it. It can be anything you want it to be. You're not held within any boundaries. Decide what you want your new story to be and write it out. And after it's done, realize you're not the programmer. I don't know how to program. If you told me I had to, I'd freak out, right? Maybe some of you know how to program. Maybe some of you don't. Once you're done with your project spec, you simply hand it to the programmers. They get to work, okay? So you don't have to do that. Don't worry about it. Just write the project spec. Write what you want your story to be. Great. So let me wrap this up here. Step six is your supporting ritual. This is the actions. This is the, where the rubber meets the road. This is, okay, I'm going to go to the gym X amount of times. Don't set long goals. Don't say, this is what I'm doing this year. An average in America, somebody sets a uh, New Year's resolution, they break it on January 6th. Okay? Don't set long goals. If you say, this is how I, long I want to do something, that's too long. Say, how long will I for sure do something? And make that your goal. It might be a day. It might be a week. It's probably not going to be a very long time. And then put down your supporting ritual end date. And then when you come to that end date, step seven is to reevaluate. What is my new gratitude score? My giving score and my growth score. And then measure how does step seven compare with step two. Once you're done, you're not... Repeat the process. Maybe you go to a different category. Maybe you were focusing on a physical body. Now you want to focus on finances or key relationships or any of the other processes. For me, in conclusion, the process, this process has changed my life. Really has. I now feel in control of my own level of personal fulfillment. I don't feel like it's tied to the size of my bank account or to anything external. If my kids do something specific, or if they don't do something specific, or if the business hits the $4 billion that we hope it will, or, 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 I now know that I'm in control of all of this, and the only way somebody else can be in control is if I actually let them. If I give away some of these powers that have been outlined here today, that you have the ability to take control of yourself and to internalize. My promise to you is as you do this, fulfillment becomes the end goal. Success will be the long tail that will likely follow. There's no guarantee it will follow. But success is relative. You might say success is a fat bank account. You might say success is a, a successful marriage. You might say it's something and define it in a certain way. But it, in reality, is completely independent of what we're all really looking for, which is personal fulfillment. So thank you so much. Uh, let me go ahead and stop there. And any questions? Yes, please.
Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, uh, I have had the luxury through my life to have a couple things that have happened to me that have been quite difficult, okay? Spoiler alert to chapter one, but in chapter one of, of the G-Cube formula, I go through two of my friends, right? One of my friends uh, we'll call Bob, and Bob kind of has a crappy life, right? Bob went down a water slide and got his leg ripped off. Uh, Bob got a corneal ulcer that rendered him completely blind, you know, Bob could barely read when he was in high school. He was reading at a third grade level. And I go through five, um, ten different stories of Bob and the difficulties that he's had. And then I go through my other friend, a childhood friend named Nelson. And I go through all of these. Actually, he's quite lucky, quite blessed. Some pretty cool things happening to Nelson. And then relate that they're actually the same person. And at the very end of the chapter, uh, share that it's actually me. And it's, uh, these are some stories, about 20 stories from, from my life. And so I, I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek that I've had the luxury of having some pretty difficult things, right? I mean, most people don't want to go down a water slide and get their, their leg ripped off. That didn't feel very good. Uh, like my younger sister who passed away, I also have cystic fibrosis. It doesn't define me, but it's something that I deal with, right? So I was an 8-year-old boy, and the doctors were telling me, hey, you're sterile. You'll never have kids. It would be irresponsible for you to ever hope to get married because if you did, likely your spouse will only be with you for a couple years and then you'll pass and leave her as a widow. And all these things that allowed me to be able to have a paradigm adjustment. We all have them, right? You could, in your own life, you could write a book about all the crap that's happened to you, all the unfair things, the injustices, right? You know, people have horrible stuff, molestations and difficult stuff that's heavy and deep poverty, but yet, why is it that Cambodia, which some of you are even going to Cambodia here soon, why are, is it that they were just ranked the, sec, the happiest country in the world the second year in a row, but yet they're arguably the poorest country on the planet? It's interesting, right? How is that possible? Happiest country in the world, second year in a row, and arguably the, the poorest country on the planet. And because it all comes back to perspective. It's how we choose to see things. It's where we see our standard and where our life is in relation to that standard. And if you're in Cambodia, probably your standard of quality of life when it comes to monetary things is way down here. But maybe your relationships are more key. Spending quality time with your spouse or kids or grandparents or whoever it might be. So it's that paradigm adjustment that, once again, I somewhat say tongue-in-cheek, I've had the opportunity to... You just look at things different when the doctors are telling you since you're a little boy, as long as you can remember, that you likely won't make it until you're an adult. It just, you just look at it different. And so I've had that blessing of seeing it different, but not in all categories. A decade ago, I felt like being financially free was the ticket to what I wanted in this life. But when I achieved it, I quickly learned that it wasn't. Nice to have. I, I believe entrepreneurship is amazing. I love it. Business is great. Capitalism is awesome, especially when you can sprinkle in it actually making a positive impact in the world in some way, right, to improve the marketplace that, that we all rely on and have a positive impact in the world that we all live in, right? So you can work both of those together, but for me, it all comes down to perspective, and we control the lenses that we choose to see, literally like glasses sitting on on a desk. You just have to choose. I choose to grab these glasses, and now your, your paradigm or your view of the world is completely different. Great. One more question. Anybody? Yes, please. Yeah, great question. So how do we know if our standard or our story is too high, if it needs to come down? It's by your outcome. Are you pleased with the outcome? And if you are pleased with the outcome, then your life is either meeting your current story or it's exceeding your current story. If you're not pleased with the outcome, well, then you know that you have one of three options. You either need to raise your life or you can raise your standard or completely change your standard. And oftentimes, some of the stickiest ones, the ones that are hardest for us to to get in line are number three, the change our standard. Because we don't really feel, it does make sense that if I am okay 10 hours of video games a day, maybe I should only be okay two. 
on that same vein, that makes sense, but completely ripping it out of what it's currently tied to and only tying it to yourself, that's the one that, that becomes very, very difficult. Well, thank you all for allowing me to be here today. You guys have a great program here with the Entrepreneurship Program. Thank you very much.